What's up, everybody? I'm Jonathan Miller, and welcome back to Jonathan Miller Music, where we help each other become better artists. K-pop has continued to grow as a global phenomenon over the last few years, and with that growth, some changes are bound to occur. As a K-pop stand for well over a decade, and as a channel that celebrates all of its generations, I thought today I'd share some of my thoughts on some of those differences as we begin to round out 2023. This is just a handful of things that I've noticed over the course of this year, and aren't necessarily negative or bad things per se, just observations. The music industry is a rapidly evolving industry, and the K-pop section of it is no exception. So naturally, I am going to be sharing my opinion, and just remember that they are just my opinions, and you're always free to disagree with me. If you do end up enjoying this video, let me know with a like and comment with your thoughts. Subscribe so you don't miss my future videos, and consider streaming my new single, The Story I've Waited to Tell, which is available now on all platforms to support this channel even further. With that out of the way, here are three major changes that I've noticed in K-pop in 2023. With debuting acts like Zero Base One, Rise, Baby Monster, Vicha, and more, believe it or not, we have officially entered K-pop's fifth generation. This is a generation marking the tail end of Gen Z and what will become the oldest of Gen Alpha in terms of age range. Generation 4 was marked by a time period battling the COVID-19 pandemic and took place after K-pop became a well-known thing around the globe, tasked with pushing that expansion further and further and will continue to do so in the coming years. Gen 4 also had to deal with the massive rise of TikTok, an app that has indisputably affected the music industry around the world. Creating a trending song and dance became even more interactive and important as we all navigated the pandemic. While the pandemic itself is not technically over, the world is coming out of it and has learned to deal with its effects. Gen 5 is the generation taking place after the pandemic, through the TikTokification of popular music, the rise of AI, and streaming domination affecting song construction and length. K-pop companies are having more of an eye on the global scale, which we'll talk more about in a minute, but Gen 5 will probably introduce more diverse groups with members of different nationalities and ethnicities. They'll also be navigating how to do so while trying to figure out how not to lose K-pop's Korean roots and what makes K-pop K-pop. Debuting minors who are like 13 or 14 years old remains a touchy subject, rightfully so, because every K-pop stand knows that the K-pop industry has its dark sides. And I don't know about you, but I don't want a child to go through that. Also, it's no secret that K-pop idols work themselves to the bone, and honestly, I don't think a child should have to go through that. Not even factoring in how to deal with fame, money, and all those sorts of things that would naturally come with being a celebrity. So while the music on the whole so far might be age appropriate, it's not perfect. I'm very curious to see how this generation will take shape with everything happening faster and faster. I'd prefer that agencies wait until trainees are older, of course, but I guess we'll just have to see what happens. K-pop is not just essentially confined to Asia anymore. It's a worldwide phenomenon helping to diverse the music that we consume. Gen Alpha is not going to have it easy coming onto the internet landscape where three other generations are still playing on the playground. Competition will be very thick, but I am hoping that if we've learned anything from Gen 3 and 4, people will be a little bit more welcoming and supportive as Gen 5 continues to push K-pop into new heights. Or maybe I'm just optimistic, but let me dream, okay? And you can take your dream to new heights with DistroKid. DistroKid is one of the top online music distributors and longtime supporter of this channel. DistroKid helped me get my newest single, The Story I've Waited to Tell, up on platforms like Spotify, Apple Music, TikTok, and Tidal, which they can also do for you. For one small yearly price, you can distribute as much music as you'd like without breaking the bank. Depending on which of DistroKid's three membership plans you decide is right for you, you'll also gain access to a gigantic library of additional features that will help you grow, manage, and promote your music career. Features include things like promo cards, getting verified on Spotify, protecting your music, and more. DistroKid also has an app for iOS that you can download right now. There's a ton you can do from right within the app, making music management on the go even easier. This includes withdrawing the money that you earn, checking out your streaming stats for all of your music, you can download your cover song licenses. Best of all, you can distribute your next release on the go from right within the app too. So use my special VIP link to save yourself 7% on your first year's membership with DistroKid. Link is in the description. 
Like I said, K-pop's global expansion is at an all-time high. It's not uncommon anymore to see K-pop stars at number one on the Billboard 200, selling out world tours, passing one million albums sold of their music, performing at award shows in foreign countries. I mean, Stray Kids had Taylor Swift completely shook at the VMAs this year. If it wasn't obvious and whether or not people like it or not, K-pop is without a doubt a worldwide thing now. Over the last few years and across several videos of mine, I've spoken at length about K-pop and the West, very publicly supporting its relationship because of how it is helping to diversify the music that people consume here. Longtime subscribers will know that I am very passionate about Asian representation in music and other types of media in the West, because while K-pop only represents a small portion of the AAPI community at large, which is very diverse within itself, it does help open the door to improve it even further. Yoasobi, a duo from Japan, reached number one on the Billboard Global 200 chart with their viral hit Idol this year. And we should all know that Asia is much more than Korea, Japan, and China. But as we become more of a connected global community in music, other groups within the AAPI community may get their chance to shine. Lest we forget that while yes, she is a K-pop idol, Lisa, a Thai woman, is the most popular female K-pop artist on Spotify. So while it's easy to group all K-pop idols into one little bubble, not every K-pop idol is Korean or ethnically Korean. And truthfully, we shouldn't ignore that, especially if K-pop's going to introduce groups in Gen 5 that are a bit more diverse. And when it comes to K-pop's relationship with the West. This year, we've seen a lot more K-pop English songs or Western collaborations. And some people have hated it, raising valid concerns about K-pop starting to feel a little less, well, K-pop. Although, considering a lot of K-pop's modern influence comes from the West anyway, especially from Black people in particular, I think that you can argue that its changing sound isn't as jarring as it may seem. It's more so of a natural progression as, like I said, we become a global community. Sounds start to influence each other in markets that used to be very separated. Not trying to negate anyone's feelings on this subject, of course. But all that being said, K-pop and the West are linked. Twice got honored at Billboard's Women in Music, Jungkook's debut album was in English, TXT collaborated with the Jonas Brothers and Anita, and Hypen debuted the English version of their song Sweet Venom on Good Morning America, Espa, Los Seraphim, G Idol, and so many more had English language tracks that did well. And Mix continues to recognize and push its Latin influence. Like I think it's safe to say that K-pop has officially targeted English speaking territories as just another area to dominate like it already does with Chinese markets and Japanese markets. And personally, if it means I get to see some of my favorite groups a little bit more and watch them grow and succeed here, and it overall helps to improve AAPI visibility in music, or at least bring more of a spotlight onto it, and it doesn't strip K-pop of what makes K-pop K-pop, then like I said, I'm all for it. The mini album in K-pop, as we've talked at length before in many videos, is a relic of the past from the 1997 Asian financial crisis, when it was much cheaper to produce EPs than it was to produce full-length albums. The same goes for single albums, and all three are treated with nearly the same amount of effort as full-length albums in K-pop. But this year especially, we've seen a lot less full albums, and a whole lot more mini albums, and there's a few reasons as to why. One of it being the obvious economic impact of the pandemic, which affected economies everywhere. But as I said earlier, it's no secret that the music industry is a rapidly evolving industry that's getting even faster. Songs are much shorter, attention spans are shorter, the demand for more content more frequently is higher than ever, and that's not lost on music industries around the globe. Full-length albums take time and money to produce and put together. EPs, or mini-albums, take less time and cost less to produce, since there's not as much music included. Also, with the tons of photo shoots, live performances, TikTok dances, collaboration TikTok dances, teasers, vlogs, documentaries, dance practices, performance videos, etc. All these things that K-pop fans want from their favorite idols, takes time to do. So the time that it would take to produce four to six more additional songs for an album can now be used to produce content in support of this mini album and save these songs for another new album to get a comeback sooner. Or, 
as is more likely, labels just save money and increase their profits because capitalism. Newer groups tend to be hit harder by this as they are the freshest faces in front of people's eyes. So the demand to get new music from these new groups is very high. At the time of this recording, Espa still doesn't have a full length album and they've now been around for over three years with tons of success and even a signature song in Next Level. But here's the kicker as many people in the West are now figuring out, people still want full length albums. They want the full package. So the question is, how do you satisfy that demand and also supply all of the content that people want nowadays? There's gonna have to be some kind of trade-off here. New groups in K-pop debut like every 10 seconds, and fans, unfortunately, are more quickly to toss out older groups if they take too long to have a comeback, even if the group is just a few years old. Then you have complaints about idols being overworked and exhausted, or they go on health hiatuses, so now you're getting a comeback but you're not getting all of the members. So even if you've got the money to produce all this, how do you satisfy everything? And the truth is, there's no magic answer right now. Comebacks in K-pop used to have much larger spaces between them, especially in gens one through three, but that's not the world we live in anymore. Personally, I would be totally fine waiting a little bit longer for a comeback if it meant we could get some full length albums again, but I'm just one person and I know for a fact that people will skip around on albums and they don't even appreciate an album as a body of work nowadays. Although I think that sentiment is starting to change back to people appreciating the album because despite what music experts were predicting, there really hasn't been a whole lot of artists that have survived off of just releasing singles and never an EP or never an album. I'm also older and having to wait for new music is something I grew up with. Younger audiences, fans of Gen 4 and Gen 5, did not grow up in that world. New Music Friday has always been a thing for them. So it's kind of tough to say if this trend will continue, but as with anything, if music fans want full albums and are willing to wait just a little bit longer for them and then make that known, then these things can probably change. It would also help if companies would stop producing like 20 versions of the albums that we do get, which drives up their sales, but exhausts fans' wallets in a time where the economy is not a lot of people's friends. But I guess that's just another change we're gonna have to wait and see what happens. Even if I low-key kind of hope it changes back to just a few different versions of albums, just to make things a little bit more manageable on the fan side. But like with everything in this video, I guess we'll find out in 2024.